Welcome to History Comes Alive, the podcast that takes you on a deep dive into a new historical topic every episode. Join us as we explore the nuances of historical events you probably didn't learn about in school. Here's your host, Jeff Nichols. Welcome back. As we discussed over the last few weeks, Captain William Pierce helped develop the idea of trade between New England and the Caribbean. He introduced African slavery to the Puritans. He almost helped to engineer a great migration away from New England, which could have devastated the emerging economy. But that never happened. On the maiden voyage of transporting New England Puritans to Providence Island, Captain Pierce was killed by the Spanish. The remaining colonists returned to Boston and the temptation for mass relocation was squashed. But the interest and opportunities for trade were realized and both regions would prosper. In fact, the opportunities were so great that nearly all the English North American colonies would benefit, as well as England. Remember, there were two economic developments at play during these years. Mercantilism, which basically represented a closed system of trade where raw materials from various colonies were shipped to the mother country, in this case, England, and finished goods were sold to the colonies. And the colonies were only to trade with other colonies of the mother country. It was a closed and centrally planned system. Some of the unrest and division that we see today around the world, well, actually since the end of World War II, it's been argued, can be traced back to colonial times when the natural resources of colonies across the globe were harvested and used for the benefit of the mother country, at the expense of the colony, if need be. From that emerged another system, which was triangular trade. This was a scenario where different colonies produced different raw materials. Instead of sending these directly to the mother country, colonies may also trade directly with each other. On one hand, it may have been cheaper and more efficient to trade directly, but on the other, it may have helped to avoid taxation, which would become a real problem over time. Another problem that would emerge was that although this system was codified, it wasn't always enforced. It couldn't possibly have been enforced all of the time, you know, realistically. So those faraway colonies did enjoy trade amongst themselves at times, but also the goods of French, Spanish, and Dutch traders as well. And we'll deal with those problems. Well, we'll see how England dealt with those problems in the next few episodes. But for now, we'll look at the triangle trade that emerged in its purest form, unadulterated without all the extracurricular side hustles that took place. Okay, so for the rest of this episode, and maybe next week's, we're going to have to have a very elastic thought process. Well, my narrative will certainly be stretched back and forth chronologically, as well as regionally. I think it will help the big picture. So going back to the beginning of the Puritan arrival, remember they were in search of a country that allowed for self-government. That was important to them, charting their own course. Every community for itself in that regard. Yet contradiction number one, for our consideration, was that Boston managed to become the regional leader. They crafted the autonomy of their neighbors, especially after 1643 and the advent of the United Colonies. But there were two more that we want to keep in mind here. First of all, the way they took the autonomy away from the natives. Now, we've developed those first two enough that we don't need to spend a lot of time on those today. But the last contradiction had a much larger and more lasting effect on everybody's colonial experience, from the Caribbean, as we'll soon develop, right through to the settlement of Carolina. And that was the active participation of the African slave trade. So let's remember that the reason for a colony at all was to benefit England. New England was a market for finished goods, but not necessarily a huge driving market to make direct trade worthwhile for the English merchant. That changed after Captain William Pierce. The slavery thing was gonna catch on real quick. It's important to note that the idea of servitude was pretty common in English society, just not servitude in perpetuity. The idea was an indentured servitude or an apprenticeship arrangement. The Puritans did engage in servitude with Europeans, but their involvement or endorsement of human ownership was really only directed at the natives and the Africans. New England is not usually associated too heavily with the colonial slave economy. It was controversial. 
but also deemed necessary. It's kind of like those little infractions the star athlete is afforded during the season, right? A wink, wink here and a nod, nod there. I mean, yeah, we're aware of this activity or that, but uh, what's the harm? I mean, we don't endorse it. He, he knows it's not right, but the benefits that we're getting from his activity, something like that, only on a grander scale, more conscience-searing and trickier. But there were signs of conscience along the way. So New England needed a real marketable commodity. They did have furs and timber and fish, but those weren't enough. And they didn't have the large-scale farming like the developing plantations down south, but they did produce food. They produced extra food, an abundance of food. And as the plantation economy took root in the Caribbean, Barbados will be our main target here. I mean, eventually, that will make sense. I mean, the folks in Barbados had a huge impact on the development of the American culture. It still does, frankly. The folks in Barbados decided that they should utilize all the land in sugar production. They realized that it was better to import their food from somewhere else and focus solely on the cash crops. Richard Vines, a Puritan doctor from New England who was working in Barbados, wrote to John Winthrop in 1647, and he said this, quote, Men are so intent upon planting sugar that they would rather buy food at very dear rates than produce it by labor. So infinite is the profit of sugar. So at any rate, the production of sugar and molasses became priority one. England proved to be too far and too expensive to buy all of their food from, but New England was not. So New England had food, and in return, they received sugar and molasses. And this is very important. The molasses was used to produce rum, lots and lots of rum. So with this new trade agreement, New England had a stable trade partner for their goods, not just lumber and fish and crops, but also beef and pork and butter, cheese, onions, cider, candles, horses, you name it. As other southern regions developed, the imports would grow to include cotton and ginger and indigo, linen, woolen clothes, iron. The production of all of this sugar took an enormous amount of labor slave labor. And the folks in New England from the first trip made by William Pierce knew that there was a market there, one that they could tap into. Shipbuilding emerged pretty quickly. I mean, Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, Rhode Island, all built ships. I mean, it really had already been developing. As far back as 1631, John Winthrop had financed the building of the Blessing of the Bay, but now it really picked up steam. Salem built a 300-ton ship in 1641. That's a big ship for those days. The industry grew and grew and grew. And by 1700, the New England region was launching 70 ships annually, more in number and tonnage than anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, over time, colonial ships accounted for 90% of the coastal and Caribbean shipping and 44% of the Atlantic routes to Africa. That's a big deal. It must have been obvious that the slave trade was coming. There's a measurable advancement over time. So we want to take a look at that. Starting in 1641, the first slave laws were codified in Massachusetts Bay's Body of Liberties. It's Article 91 if you wanted to look that up. I'm not too interested in exactly what the article said at this point, but it, the reality is that slavery had moved from acceptable to regulated. It was a hotly contested subject, but also a difficult momentum to stop as the potential commercial gains were enormous. We're going to look at both sides of this with the development of the industry and then one example of the controversial nature of African slaves. So in 1645, continuing with our development, Emanuel Downing, John Winthrop's brother-in-law, wrote him a letter encouraging a war with the Narragansetts. He's trying to provoke it. He was advocating for slavery in New England and a general slave industry. He said that the natives would be traded for African slaves if, of course, it was a just war. I mean, yeah, let's plan a just war. I think that the idea that you're planning the war or you're looking for a reason to have a war kind of ruins the part of it being just. But his suggestion was that if they could have a just war with the natives, they could trade those for African slaves. What he wrote was, quote, I suppose you know very well how we shall maintain 20 moors cheaper than one English servant, end quote. That idea floated by Downing was rejected by the Puritans in New England. The magistrates decided to forego the plantation model. I mean, as we've discussed, it wouldn't have worked up there anyways. 
They did, however, decide to participate in the slave industry just from a more dignified, maybe longer distanced position. They would supply the transport. The Caribbean trade opportunities were not the only ones that they explored. Mark Peterson tells the story of John Smith and Thomas Kesar. They made the first direct voyage to West Africa in a ship named Rainbow. In Africa, they met up with some London slave traders who claimed the natives had previously accosted them. There's that pretense, a, a just excuse for what would happen next. The group kidnapped several people. And when the locals complained, they attacked a whole town and they killed a bunch more people. I mean, think about the horror of that exchange for the locals, already well aware of the growing slave trade, the theft of their own people. Think about the horror and the fear that these men and men like them must have struck into these locals to begin with. Anyways, Smith and Kesar took their share of the bounty, the slaves, and returned to New England via the West Indies. And when they returned to Boston, they sold the last two Africans on board the ship. But then those two had a falling out and they ended up in court. And here's where it gets a little hazy, a little hypocritical, and also a great example of the very confusing and contradictory policies that slavery produced. Remember, this is about the time that John Elliott and the Mayus on Martha's Vineyard were ramping up their missionary endeavors, you know, to bring the gospel to the heathen, to show them the way of salvation through the love of God. And there was already at least one African that had been admitted to the church with full membership, I believe at this point. If not, it was coming soon. So in a way, the ideas about Africans were confusing, whether you accepted them or not. Were they to be, you know, always slaves or could some be free? I mean, quite possibly. The first casualty of the Boston massacre was a former African slave, Crispus Attucks. He was part of the mob that was threatening the English guard that day, and he was killed. So anyway, the point is that the whole race thing was contentious and confusing from the beginning in New England. I mean, the key is to just follow the money, right? It's like almost every other political controversy. If there's a question of ethics or morality or integrity, you're going to have two sides on the issue. The question is who's making the most money? I mean, what's the real motivation? So the magistrates understood that what had happened in Africa was not right. You know, attacking a town and killing a bunch of people when they complained about your previous abuse. But they declined to punish the men for that action. They reasoned that it was out of their jurisdiction and the London guys had at least claimed some justification. So I guess as long as the atrocity doesn't happen too close, we'll just let it slide, right? I mean, that seems to have been the reaction. It wasn't right, but we didn't see it. It's really not in our jurisdiction. We're not going to get involved. Since the earliest days of colonization with the Spanish and the Portuguese, the idea of war and colonization was based on if it was just. That debate centered around various campaigns in Europe and how to deal with non-Christian groups that they wanted to remove or fight, like in the Crusades. So anyway, I think we talked about that in the first series of episodes way back when we were dealing with Europe. But, you know, here it is 100 years later and they're still having that discussion, you know, what represents a just war? And if the war is deemed just, does killing or enslaving other people have legitimacy? So at any rate, the violence that had taken place was reasoned away. But there were still the two captives to deal with. The magistrates were not persuaded that their capture was a result of a just war. Again, there's that contradiction. So they ordered them to be released and returned to Africa. I mean, you see the confusion, the hypocrisy here, right? That's crazy. Killing the villagers wasn't something we're going to punish you for, but you can't keep the slaves that you have either. I mean, no doubt they understood the growing expanse of the African slave trade. And they're thinking to themselves, or maybe they're talking amongst each other, you know, basically, let's plan to involve ourselves in the slave trade. But not support how these guys were taken. I mean, since their experience is front and center, I mean, these are real people that we're face to face with. They need to go back. But how did they think anyone else was going to be taken? Did they think it was going to be a pleasant experience? Gentle? Voluntary? Probably not. But it was expedient for their economy. And besides, they'd be pretty good at not thinking too hard about the brutality of it all. But when you think about it, 
Almost the whole of the New England economy would be invested in the industry, whether it was the building of ships or the sailing of ships or the trade with Barbados for food or the reception of sugar, or more importantly, molasses, fishing, lumber, finished goods, very quickly, virtually everything they produced was for some measure of the triangular trade routes that invariably included African slaves. We'll distill those routes down in just a few minutes. Before that, however, let's look a little closer at what the New England economy's relation to the slave trade was. They represented a middle point between Africa and the West Indies and the Caribbean. The trade was building in Barbados as well. In 1645, still on that timeline, the same year that Emmanuel Downing was urging wars with the natives and John Smith and Thomas Keisher were taking part in the slave raid in Africa, Another Winthrop, John's nephew this time, wrote to him from Barbados, reporting that they had purchased, quote, a thousand Negroes, and the more they buy, the better able they are to buy, for in a year and a half, they will earn, with God's blessing, as much as they cost, end quote. Piracy created wealth, but it didn't generate greater wealth in and of itself. Without the building of self-sustaining infrastructure, what happened to Spain and Portugal? Just like later in the southern colonies, and we'll see the slave economy actually stunted economic growth by limiting advancement. Barbados, too, would not fully develop as they imported almost all their food and other goods. They didn't fully industrialize. And that will catch up with any society. You have to develop some type of internal system to support yourself, or you're left most vulnerable in times of crisis. John C. Calhoun, one of the great statesmen of pre-Civil War America, a senator from South Carolina, which we'll talk about next week when we look at the initial colonization of Carolina itself. John C. Calhoun gives us a great illustration of this principle. He had urged the Southern states to industrialize in the middle of the 19th century. Now, he died in 1850. So this is, you know, a decade or more, more than a decade before the Civil War. But that was a call that was largely unheeded. Calhoun seemed to know instinctively that long-term slavery would not carry the South forward. When the Civil War came, their industrialized sector was woefully, grossly inferior to the North, and it cost them. And that's a conversation for a little later in this series, probably a lot later in this series. But anyway, the fledgling trade triangle between New England, Spain, and England of fish and wool had not produced a broad enough wealth across enough of the population to really move the needle. So piracy doesn't work. And a lack of, you know, building of self-sustaining infrastructure doesn't work. And not having broad enough economic movement doesn't move the needle. The wampum and the fur trade was not wholly sustainable long-term. What was happening now would produce a broad wealth across the larger population. It would sustain an economy long-term. And the race was on. Although everyone in New England would benefit, the real race was between Rhode Island and Massachusetts Bay. Rhode Island took the lead and never looked back. The first African slaves arrived in Rhode Island in 1638. The practice was controversial. In 1652, institutional perpetual slavery was abolished by law. I think Roger Williams had a lot of influence on that. The law was similar in approach to the European indentured servants. It declared that no, quote, black mankind, end quote, could be indentured for more than 10 years. But clearly, this law was on the books, but it wasn't enforced. There were never very many slaves numerically in Rhode Island, but its African population did become the largest by ratio of any of the New England colonies. The highest concentration of slaves were to be found in South County or Narragansett County, today's Washington County. Here, the farms grew to mirror the plantations of the southern colonies. But for our focus, we need to pay more attention to the slave industry, the pass-through, transient, middleman status for the transport of the Africans. Merchants from Newport and Providence and Bristol enjoyed both a proximity to the sea and the finished goods of the region. They traded directly with the Caribbean, Africa, and the developing coastal settlements along the eastern seaboard of North America. Until 1696, the English Royal African Company had enjoyed a monopoly on the Atlantic slave trade. Then it was lifted, and Rhode Island jumped into the broader Atlantic trade with both feet. This included African slavery, 
Before too long, Rhode Island, the smallest of the colonies, accounted for a vast majority of the slave ships from the English colonies. To underscore just how extensive the involvement of Rhode Island was, proportionally and otherwise, historian Christy Clark Pajara, in her book, Dark Work, The Business of Slavery in Rhode Island, says that during the colonial period, Rhode Island sent 514 slave ships to West Africa, dwarfing the 189 combined from the rest of the colonies. For all intents and purposes, Rhode Island was the direct slave trade of New England. In 1713, Rhode Island slave traders introduced a new commodity to the African slave trade, rum. Rum was already a big commodity for the New England colonies. New England was already shipping their goods to the Caribbean and Southern colonies, especially food items, and rum and other goods to England. But adding rum to the equation of the African slave trade was a real game changer. The slave traders in Africa liked the rum better than they liked the previous alcohol of choice, French brandy. So frankly, in a way, you're killing two birds with one stone, right? I mean, the English trade grew, new commodity going in, and French trade was reduced. So here we can envision one of those trade triangles that emerged. The rum of Rhode Island was shipped to West Africa. There it was traded for African slaves, mostly bound for the Caribbean sugar colonies, where they would be traded for sugar and molasses, which would be shipped back to Rhode Island for the production of more rum. All of New England was in the rum business. It was cheap, comparatively speaking. The cost of a slave was equivalent to two to three pounds production cost of rum. The slave could be sold in Barbados for 30 to 80 pounds. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of profit, as long as you can keep the slaves alive in transport. The other trade route was north to south. Food and supplies from New England went south, directly to the Caribbean, and sugar and molasses went north without passing through the ports of England. Rum was king. It was the largest single manufacturing industry in New England. Rhode Island had no less than 30 distilleries. Massachusetts claimed 63. They were making 5 million gallons annually earlier in the 18th century. And by the time of the American Revolution, they were producing 6 million gallons of rum a year. In fact, it wasn't until after the American Revolution that whiskey overtook rum for alcohol consumption in America. The sugar and molasses trade had been disrupted during the war, and there was an abundance of corn. It was cheaper and it was more plentiful. It was local. It also became an issue with such historical uprisings as the Whiskey Rebellion, which was a militarized protest against taxes on whiskey. Eventually, the federal government put down that rebellion, but it took three years. In short, the newly formed government needed cash. They needed to raise that cash through taxes. Congress approved a tax on whiskey and the stills that produced it. The farmers of Western Pennsylvania took exception to this. That was a major industry for them. The larger producers received tax breaks while the smaller producers bore a much larger burden. The issues of federal authority and taxation and equity were challenged. Anyway, I thought about doing a separate episode on the Whiskey Rebellion, so you got that little tidbit for free. You probably have already heard about it anyways. But that's one of those events in American history I've thought about, like I say, doing like a bonus episode. There's a few other events as well. But at any rate, rum would be king for over a century. Now, this development is important, this rum industry was such a wide reach into so many other industries. It was greatly affected a century later with the enactment of the Sugar Act. You see how all this stuff from the 17th century directly impacted colonial relations all those years later. That's why this is important. Taxes like the sugar tax were specific. They were targeted for the most impact, like the later tax on whiskey. Targeted taxation for identifiable, reliable income. They also hurt the merchants. They helped to galvanize the colonials, just like the writs of assistance, which would be codified in the closing decade of the 17th century and reintroduced after the French and Indian War. And the Navigation Acts were also introduced during this time. And actually, we'll talk about them in a couple of weeks. But anyway, as we work through these issues from early colonial America, we begin to build a reservoir of information that helps to explain all sides of many of the coming debates. The argument against the Sugar Act 
would be that it was not just about sugar. So many of the industries in New England were based on triangular trade. Remove the sugar and you remove the rum. Remove the rum and you destroy the trade routes. If we go that far and consider the idea behind mercantilism, England wasn't as concerned about the economic hardship of increased targeted taxation. Their goal was money. Their goal was to have, you know, markets for their finished goods. They didn't care how the colonials suffered. That was the perception anyways. So slavery was integral. It was controversial. It was out of sight for most New Englanders, something that everybody was aware of, but not on a firsthand basis. One historian captured the essence of the merchant class of Massachusetts with this, quote, destruction of the Negro commerce would throw 5,000 seamen out of employment and would cause 700 ships to rot in idleness, end quote. So it was quickly enshrined in the economy of New England. But again, the topic was debated. Boston, all of New England, also became a hotbed of the anti-slavery movement. Some people recognized the hypocrisy of a colony designed for independence participating in the enslavement of other people. But the industry continued to grow. And as we said earlier, in 1696, England's Royal Africa Company's monopoly on the African slave trade ended and it exacerbated the controversy as the door was wide open for increased participation in the African slave trade. The whole debate can be illustrated through the lens of one of Boston's most prominent figures at the close of the 1600s. Samuel Sewall was a minister, a merchant, and a magistrate in Boston. He was a graduate of Harvard. He was one of the judges at Salem, but he seems to have been a better man than would have taken place there. He was the only judge who would later publicly admit the mistakes that were made in executing 19 people. Well, his reputation historically can be repaired from another situation that he addressed head on. He's also somewhat of a historian. We learn a lot about the, the times in which he lived through a diary that he kept for 50 years. It's actually a book entitled The Diary of Samuel Sewall. But he was also an anti-slaver. And I picture him to be a man of great conviction and great courage. I mean, he owned Salem, right? But then he comes out against slavery. And in this time when the economy is growing and everybody's making money, he's the one guy that stands up and has this conscience, right? I mean, this is a century before William Wilberforce. So it seems there came up a court case of a slave named Adam who had been promised his freedom, and he was now demanding it. The system that had developed for decades gave rights to the slave owner. And so Adam effectively had none legally. And to make matters worse, Adam's owner was another Massachusetts Bay justice named John Saffin. Now, Seawall was not able to grant Adam his freedom. I mean, I can just see this backroom discussion between Seawall and probably everybody else. I mean, I'm just imagining this hypothetically, but you know, look, Sam, we got a good thing going here. I mean, I get the irony here. I do, but We've got a great thing going here in Massachusetts Bay. I mean, we all have an interest in uh, some sort or other in commerce, and somehow it's all connected to the slave trade right now. I know I do. We just can't go around freeing slaves. I mean, look at the precedent that you'd be setting. Look at the lives and the livelihoods that you'd be threatening. Do you really want to upset your neighbors like that? I don't know. I think that's probably about as pleasant a conversation as I can see them having it probably got a whole lot nastier. There's a whole lot of guys making a whole lot of money. I doubt they were about to allow him to ruin it for everybody. So Samuel Sewall took his case to the general public and publicly in print attacked the slave trade and recognized the hypocrisy of it in a Christian commonwealth. In his book, The Selling of Joseph, published in 1700, he argued that no good could come of slavery. It was man-stealing. Even the evangelism of the slaves did not justify the institution. But again, there was a lot of money being made. But I really do admire him. I mean, this is 100 years before William Wilberforce. Most people involved were not directly involved in the slave trade. Maybe they were ignorant of the entire industry or the harsh reality of it. Either way, out of sight, out of mind, it would be quite some time before a majority of consciences were pricked on the horrors of the institution. But for our purposes, just realize that along with the growth of the slave industry, there grew up around it opposition. 
So we developed the first main triangular trade route using Rhode Island as our colonial starting point, although you could include Massachusetts as well, which shipped New England rum primarily to West Africa and Africans to the Caribbean and sugar back to New England. The second triangle that emerged was far more classic and compatible with the mercantilist system. The relationships were a bit more complicated, but we'll sketch out a rough illustration. In this triangle, imagine the three corners or points as England, North America, which includes all of the English colonies, and Africa. Remember, the entire working model was designed to benefit England. So beginning with England then, after receiving the raw materials from the various colonies, England sent finished goods to North America and to Africa. And there was a slightly different makeup between those two regions. Some of the more important goods shipped to Africa were guns, cloth, iron, and beer. Africa did not send slaves to England so much as they sent gold and ivory, spices, and hardwood. So the raw materials from Africa, the raw materials, the things, the inanimate objects, they went to England. The people went to the colonies. That's one side of the triangle. Another side was the relation between England and North America, of which there's three general regions. There's the Caribbean, which shipped sugar and molasses and wood to England. And then there's the southern colonies, which we're going to at least introduce next week. We'll address a few things with them. They supplied England with rice and silk and indigo and tobacco. And then thirdly, there's New England's contribution, which included whale oil and the fishing industry and furs and rum and lumber. Notice that England needed a lot of wood. Three of the four regions were supplying wood, furniture, housing, ships. I mean, they're an island with, you know, dwindling forests. So the lumber and wood industry was vitally important. And again, on top of those trade routes designed to enrich England, the North American colonies developed trade routes with each other as well. We've talked about most of that trade already, but the one commodity that was shipped from the Caribbean to what would become the Southern colonies that we've not mentioned yet was slaves, African slaves. In fact, they actually relocated some of the plantation growers from Barbados to the mainland. And in many ways, we still feel the effects of that infusion of Barbadian planters into Carolina. They were Anglicans. Remember, many of the colonists outside of New England wanted to instill a type of European feudalism in the colonies. The sugar industry of the Caribbean might have been a young industry as far as the English were concerned, but it had already developed a unique cultural identity, and it would help to shape the identity of much of the Southern plantation economy. But that's a story for next time. And until then, I hope our time together this time has really helped the history to come alive. Thanks for listening to History Comes Alive. We hope today's episode has given you valuable new information and inspired you to dive even deeper. Don't forget to check out Jeff's website, historywithjeff.com, and engage with Jeff across all your favorite social media platforms at History with Jeff. Join us next time as more history comes alive.